Hello everybody and welcome to the first of my videos actually shot in 2021. It's been a bit of an odd start to the year and I hope by the time this is actually released things are going to be a little bit better for everyone. However, this is going to be a very enjoyable experience for me because today we're looking at one of my favourite categories of car, the Bargain Luxo Barge. Here in Britain we have a very odd view on cars and because of that you'll find that there are certain things that seem to be just unreasonably good value for money. Generally speaking, any big luxury car will depreciate like nobody's business, which means that you wind up in this odd scenario where after about 10 or 15 years, a £25,000 one series and a £75,000 seven series are pretty much the same money to buy. Now, of course, a lot of people will say that the actual cost of a luxury car isn't in the purchase price, it's in the running. And my experience of those kind of cars would say that that is generally true, as much as I'd wish that it wasn't. There is, however, one luxury brand that does seem to buck that trend. Lexus. In the UK we've never really been fans of the mark, but in the USA they just can't get enough of them. And every time I drive one I keep thinking, why is that? Why don't we buy more of these? Because generally they're pretty cool cars. In terms of the current crop I can kind of understand why most people wouldn't be interested. They're not particularly cheap, the trim levels can be somewhat confusing if you're not used to them, you don't seem to get a lot for your money if you get a base car, and the engine and gearbox combos are somewhat limited. It's pretty difficult to get one with a fruity engine, manual gearboxes are pretty rare now, and the automatics seem to be mostly the C VT variety, which I don't think anyone really likes. Of course you do have the odd corker, like the LC500, which is one of my favourite cars, and the RCF, which is spectacular, but a very, very rare thing on the roads of Great Britain. What I'm in today is a 2006 LS430. Now this is the very last of the third generation LS. LS standing for Luxury Saloon. They're now on the fifth generation car and the third generation really was a very important vehicle for Lexus. It is often credited as being one of the cars that really popularised the brand in the United States, where this sold extremely well. You had a lot of different options for trim and spec and all sorts over there that you didn't get here. In its home market of Japan, this was actually one of the last cars to also have a Toyota equivalent, the Celsior, I think. The reason for that being that Lexus didn't actually exist in Japan until the introduction of the LFA. So all of the cars after this were then badged as a Lexus. I've never really been quite sure why that is. I think probably because in Japan they all knew that Toyotas could be a very, very good high quality car, whereas out in the West we had to be fooled with some marketing trickery to believe that the Japanese could knock something up anywhere near as good as their German rivals. And I think it is the Germans that in the UK cause the most problems for Lexus because people still absolutely need to have a German badge on their car if they want to be respected by pretty much anybody. BMWs, Mercedes, Audis, they're all over the place here in Britain. They more or less killed off the normal Vauxhall or Ford quite some time ago. Used to be, two decades ago, you'd see loads of Mondeos and Cavaliers and stuff like that on the roads of Britain, but now it's a 3 Series, a 5 Series, a C-Class, or a crossover of some sort. In fact, I'm pretty sure Jaguar sell a lot more cars here than Lexus do. So what then is special about this car? Well first off, you can pick one up for a song, and that's rather important if it's going to be considered a bargain Luxo barge. This is the last of line, final model year 2006, and it was picked up for less than £5,000. It's a lot of car for not a lot of money. Now unlike its German rivals, there were nowhere near as many variants to choose from with the LS430. In fact, you had a choice of only one engine and one wheelbase. The car itself is about 5 metres long, so it is firmly in that category of 7 Series S-Class Jaguar XJ. The engine is a 4.3 litre 3UZ V8. 
it's mated here to a six-speed automatic gearbox. Pre-facelift cars had a five-speed. That gearbox and engine combo work together really well. And amazingly, they can actually be quite economical. In fact, James set the trip computer before he came down to me this morning and on a one-hour journey averaged just shy of 30 miles to the gallon. That's good. The engine puts out about 290 horsepower, about 320 pound foot of torque or so. It's not really about speed with a car like this though, it's about the driving experience and I've got to say from in here this is easily the equal of any S-Class or 7 Series I've ever driven. Ride quality is superb. In America you could get these with either conventional or air ride, but here air ride was standard on all of them. Let's put our foot down. There you go. Car eventually, if you put your foot all the way down, will kick down, but it's merely brisk. 0 to 60 time was something like 6.7 seconds. This was never really a fast car, but that's not what these were ever about. It's a reasonably light car in its class, about 1.8 to 1.9 tons or thereabouts, which makes it a lot lighter than my old V12 7 series. Damping is absolutely superb. There are modes for the suspension. I'm going to put it in sport just to see what that does and you can feel that it does firm things up just a little bit. We'll try it in some bends in just a moment. You've also got a power and snow mode for the traction control and you can adjust the height in the car as well. One of the things I really like about Air Ride is being able to, on command, raise the car up because it means that it's just that little bit more practical if you are going to go down a lumpy or bumpy road with bits of debris and roadkill and whatever in the middle of it. The interior, and that really is the most important bit of a car like this, is very typically Japanese luxury, which is to say in some ways it's still far behind its German rivals. Quality of the switch gear is I would say decent and probably in fairness on par with the W220 S class of a reasonably similar time frame. You've got plenty of goodies like electric seats which have memory and they're also heated and cooled in the front. You've got heating and massage in the back. I think you've probably got massage up front as well. You have multi-zone climate control. You've even got oscillating vents here. Adorably, there's also still a cassette player in this car should you so desire to put a bit of steely down on. The leather quality of the seats is superb but a lot of the rest of the car isn't quite as good as you might find in, say, a top-end Merc or BMW. That being said, this was a low point for Mercedes as well, and I think, actually, if I'm being fair, this is probably every bit the equal of the S-Class of the time. You do have a fridge in here, although fridge is perhaps pushing it a little bit. You get a couple of cans of Coke in it, and it's run off the aircon system, but it's better than nothing. And importantly, it means you don't lose too much room from the boot which is actually a pretty decent size too. Often cars in this class have a slightly stingy capacity in the back, which makes them not so good for airport runs. This one's pretty decent. Despite the fact there's no long wheelbase option, I'd say legroom in the back is pretty good. It's not amazing, but it's going to be more than adequate for most people and most uses. Top class executive transport, it's not, but then Toyota would have told you that's what the century is for. Compared to the Nissan President that I recently drove, this does feel somewhat more modern. It also feels a little bit more Western luxury, there are a lot more nice features in here. And it's also a much better driver's car. The President was very sloppy in the bends. This one is much better damped. In typical Japanese fashion though, I think really the luxury element of this car was in the engineering. You have double wishbone suspension all round, which is one of my favourite setups. turning circle is brilliant and every year that this car was in production it won the JD power survey for reliability in fact it went down in history as one of the most reliable cars ever produced which is extremely good news if you are looking at picking one of these up on a budget now its owner James has had to replace a few things but they've been really what you'd consider maintenance items, uh, bearings and such like. And I would expect if you are going to pick up a cheap car like this to expect a few things to need doing. Those aforementioned bearings, uh, bushes, all big cars have an appetite for bushes, regular service items may need looking at, brakes and all that sort of stuff. But by and large the Lexus seems to be 
a very, very decent car for little outlay. What are the downsides? Well, it's hard to really think of too many beyond the fact that most people don't really understand what it is. I would say that it's not a particularly stylish car. Neither the facelifted version or the original LS430 I think were lookers. The, the later cars were a little bit better and this apparently was the Japanese designers sort of going a bit wild because they thought the second generation car was too conservative. Um, it's not that wild but you'll find that in this category of car they never really tend to go that mad because that's not what buyers want what they want is a premium driving experience and you really do get that with this car there are certainly hints of Jaguar XJ about it I would say it's a shame that they never did a more sporting version of this car because I think actually it could have taken more power quite happily there is just that distant rumble of V8 in the background I can certainly move you down the road at a reasonable pace, but it feels a bit wrong doing that really. Even with some of my spirited driving, I've only managed to drop the average to just under 28 to the gallon. Really very impressed with this car. In fact, I'm gonna turn it out of sport mode, out of power and the gearbox. Doesn't really do an awful lot as far as I can see, and enjoy the ride. And there's lots of other things to enjoy here too. The pantograph movement on the wiper at the front, which is quite a trick and takes a long time to work out how it works. This car is, totally devoid of any creaks, rattles, squeaks, or anything untowards. You have soft close on all four doors, although oddly the boot is still a sort of regular manual item. I would have thought it might have had electric open and close, but no. I guess one of the biggest problems that this car has is that for only a few thousand pounds more than this particular example, so you're sort of seven to eight grand mark, you could get into the fourth generation car, which is going to be quite a bit quicker, a little bit newer of course, with a lot more tech inside and just generally probably a better car. Uh, but ultimately, if you're the sort of person that isn't fussed by a car being that much newer or faster, I'd say the LS430 does seem to give you everything that you'd want. And the way that Lexus sold these means that unlike many German cars, you're not gonna have to spend forever trying to decipher all the option codes and things. As far as I'm aware, this car has only one actual option on it. And that is the radar guided cruise control, cleverly disguised as the Lexus badge at the front. I'm not entirely sure I'm sold on this wood trim. I'm not quite sure I'm ready for that. I sort of put up with it in my S-Class, but it was a bit darker and easier to live with. I'm still more of a sort of a dark black ash sort of type person, but you know, it's fine. It suits the kind of car. It's a bit granddad spec, but you know what? Sometimes granddads do know what they're talking about. Steering, as you might expect it, is reasonably slow, very light, brakes and throttle much the same, very easy car to drive. And I'm really not looking forward to getting back into my one series after this. This particular car has done just shy of 100,000 miles. And from the feel of it, I don't doubt at all that it's got at least another 100,000 in it. If you currently are in the market for a bargain barge and you're on the fence as to whether it's a sensible thing to do or not, I'd say that perhaps the Lexus LS430 is one of the best ways to dip your toes in that world. Is it gonna be a fault-free experience? Probably not. But is it gonna be easier to live with than all of its German rivals and British too? I'd say so. And most importantly, are you losing anything by buying the Lexus? Nope, don't think so. Anyway, that's enough from me. I hope you've enjoyed today's short little video. Don't forget to comment down below like, subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you all for the next one. Bye-bye.